This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. And welcome to Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond from Aberdeen at the ALBA Party's National Council. Now on St Andrew's Day this year, ALBA's new MSP Ash Reagan launched an audacious bid to break the independence deadlock. She proposed a new referendum to allow the Scottish Parliament to have the powers to legislate on and negotiate for Scottish independence. Now, to add to the drama, Ash proposes that the new referendum should be held 10 years to the day on which the first one was declared. Today, we examine Alba's bold initiative to see what it consists of and to evaluate its chance of success. Now, we make no claim to be impartial, but we can say we are informed. So let's start with the shots of Ash Reagan's St Andrew's Day declaration. Apart from Alex being there too, you might just recognise the chair. Alba, as you know, proposed that at each and every election, political parties supporting independence should stand on an unambiguous mandate to negotiate independence from Westminster. If a majority of votes are achieved for independence, then the Scottish Government should mobilise popular and international pressure to implement that mandate. However, that doesn't prevent additional democratic action now in seeking the view of people in extending the powers of the Scottish Parliament. So I want to ensure that people of Scotland are able to express their view, and that would be via a lawful referendum on the 19th of September 2024, on whether or not the Scottish Parliament should have the powers to negotiate and to legislate for independence for Scotland. The National Movement of Scotland desperately needs ideas at the present moment to take matters forward. It's clearly not going to be adequate <coughs> to go into a general election and say what we're doing is campaigning to ask Westminster to give us a referendum. I mean, I think we've been down that road since 2014. Uh, so new initiatives and new ideas are needed, and certainly one that puts the initiative back into the hands of the Scottish Parliament. It should be one that everybody welcomes. And the fact that Ash is putting forward the bill should not stop anybody who's interested in Sc Scottish independence uh, signing up to it and being enthusiastically in support of it. Well, if you've got the two things, if you've got a referendum showing that people want the issue of independence to be decided by the Parliament, if you've got a majority in an election saying an instruction by a majority of votes to negotiate independence, then you've got an irresistible uh, double uh, a whammy on Westminster. You've got the, the two things that are necessary, the referendum plus the popular assent. You know, both the saying that yes, they should have the power to do it and the people instructing politicians to exercise that power. Very difficult for any government anywhere to resist that sort of democratic imperative. We've always been looking for a, a way to bend Westminster to the will of the Scottish people. I, I think uh, Ash Reagan may well have unlocked that door.
Welcome back. So let's hear directly on why this initiative has legs from Alba's two parliamentary leaders, Neil Hanvey MP at Westminster and Ash Reagan MSP at Holyrood. They are with Alex. I'd like to discuss the independence bills across two parliaments. I'm joined by two group leaders, Ash Reagan, the Alapa group leader in the Scottish Parliament, and Neil Hanvey MP, the Alapa leader in the Westminster Parliament. Now, turning to, to you first, Ash Reagan, last week you introduced this Parliamentary Powers Bill on Independence. Why do you think that's a, a key initiative in the independence debate? Yes, so I've uh, introduced the, the possibility next year of, of taking forward um, a Members Bill in the Scottish Parliament um, that has the opportunity to extend the powers of the Scottish Parliament. So we'd be asking the people of Scotland whether they think the Scottish Parliament should be the decision-making body, if you like, in terms of things about legis legislating for Scottish independence and negotiating for Scottish independence. So um, in conjunction with the uh, ALBA party's election strategy of running each and every election as an opportunity for the Scots to decide their own future, I think this does present um, a double lock on moving independence forward and giving um, back to the people of Scotland their choice about their own future. So it's this combination between the Parliament having the ability to consult the people on that question eh, and the electors having the ability to vote for independence at a Scottish or a general election, that you think that kind of pincer movement gives it its democratic strength? Absolutely. This would be a very, very strong, you know, should these both these be successful, you know, we get over 50% of the vote in, let's say, the next Scottish election across the pro-independence parties and the Scottish people have made it very clear that they think the Scottish Parliament should be in charge of issues about negotiating independence, then that is an undeniable instruction from the people of Scotland about how they see their future. Now, Neil Hanvey, you, you proposed a self-determination bill in the Westminster Parliament. Do, do you see Ash's bill as continuing that initiative? Well, yeah, I mean, I think what, what both um, proposals demonstrate is that we're prepared to advance the discussion beyond, uh, a, you know, a repeating a request for a Section 30 order, uh, as others have been doing over the last number of years. And, uh, and, and I think that our initiatives have clearly got the Westminster government on the hop. Um, I had a, a debate, in uh, an adjournment debate last week, and, and the, the minister responding was, uh, had prepared a speech to say, you keep asking for a referendum. It wouldn't take my intervention to correct him that I wasn't asking for a referendum at all. I was telling him that the people of Scotland will have their say through each and every subsequent election if that is the decision that they so choose. And so our uh, self-determination bill, the, the, the bill that I uh, tabled in Westminster as a companion piece to the legislation that Ash is uh, planning to introduce to the Scottish Parliament, take uh, a significant step forward in the discussion around how we advance the case for independence whilst others are stuck in a discussion that has been proven to be utterly hopeless uh, now for nine years. And now in the future, presumably you'll be able to say, we're going to have our own referendum, we don't need you. Indeed, but you know, I think we what we've shown, uh, I think that's the right decision and it will be the, the, the right answer uh, should the legislation be successful. But I think what we've shown is that, you know, by introducing the self-determination bill, by um, uh, introducing the same principle as an amendment to the recent King's speech, and by focusing on Scotland's right to self-determination in my response to the King's speech, um, that was not mirrored in any way by um, the SNP. Stephen Flynn didn't mention independence once in his contribution or his response to the King's speech. And, and I think that tells its own story. Our priority uh, uh, is principally independence, but underneath independence is the opportunity to advance so many areas of public policy that people are desperate to see delivered. And that's why independence is important, because we can make the change that's necessary to advance the lives of the people of Scotland. Ash I was thinking, as, uh, as Neil Hanley was speaking, that that very, very powerful imagery of the 2014 referendum Scotland's future in Scotland's hands, mm -hmm. very famous poster illustrated that. Would you say that the initiatives you're putting forward basically follow that uh, essential guideline? 
I would, and I think it's important to do that. We haven't seen much movement, I think, towards independence or initiatives that might um, progress us towards independence in the last number of years. I think there is a, an appetite out there, certainly from the, the wider movement and possibly and hopefully from the other pro-independence parties, that this is something that can or has the um, opportunity to unite the movement, to unite everyone behind the cause and we can all um, move forward towards independence, you know, operating as one voice. So there, that opportunity is there to bring everyone together, give people the, um, the, you know, the offer that independence is possible, that we can take control of that, of, you know, working towards that ourselves. So I think it is the right thing to do. Now, your initiative was just a week old. I mean, what, what kind of response have you had uh, to date? Uh, you know, people rallying around the, the initiative? It's interesting. So I think there, there's certainly been a number of, of people in other pro-independence parties who are seeing the, the credibility and uh, the sense in this strategy. So I hope that that will build. I'm looking forward to having some conversations with my, my former colleagues in the SNP and perhaps even in the Green Party as well. Um, an opportunity to discuss this and hopefully to get them on board with the idea. Now, Neil Hanvey, uh, obviously you famously uh, won your seat in, uh, in Kirkcaldy and Cowden Beef as a an independent uh, nationalist, and you'll be defending. But you're going to be joined by a number of Fallopa candidates from the, the verdict of the Fallopa National Council. How important do you see the, the general election as a building block to independence, given that Alapa's underlying strategy is a big breakthrough at the next Scottish elections in two and a half years' time? Well, I mean, our preferred option would be that the independence movement would unite and uh, fight any Westminster election under the, the banner of Scotland United and we have brought that initiative to life in Westminster working alongside um, our former SNP colleague uh, Angus Brenda McNeil. So you know my, my view is that you know we have to give um, some credibility to our position as a political party. You know, we're a young party. Our expectations may not be stratospheric, but we have a, a very clear, distinct message, not just on independence, but across a whole range of important policy areas that the Scottish public deserve to have the right to give their uh, support to. And I, I'm excited uh, to, to be fighting uh, my, my uh, re-election uh, in the next um, Westminster test, but you know, everything that we do is fundamentally about winning the cause of Scottish independence. It's not about you know having another five years, and it should never be about another five years on the green benches. That has to be extinguished as a, 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 as a reason for those elections. It has to be fundamentally about independence and we know that every single one of the Alapa party candidates will have that guiding ambition, that absolute focus on independence. That's not in any doubt of my, uh, uh, any doubt of my mind at all. And do you think the, this twin track of uh, having an appeal for a vote for an independence mandate, a straightforward mandate to negotiate independence and the initiative to have a a referendum to seek the approval of the people for that to be within the powers of the, the parliament, the negotiation for independence. Is that a, a strong support and buttress to your uh, appeal? I, I think it is. I, I think the, the um, independence movement uh, is desperate for a, a focus and a destination uh, it, whether that's a date or an ambition is, you know, is debatable, but we need something, something more meaningful than we'll ask once again and be denied. Uh, and that's something that Alapa are unique in offering uh, the people of Scotland in this forthcoming Westminster election and every subsequent general election, either Scottish or Westminster in future. Now, Ashley, you're putting forward the view that if the, the government were to get behind your bill, if they were to perhaps think about it over the Christmas break, goodwill, and come back and support it, you could actually have a referendum uh, next year on the 19th of uh, September, the 10th anniversary of the date of announcement of the, the last referendum. Would that actually be possible? Yeah, I think it would be possible, especially in the circumstances you set out where the Scottish Government you know, have a look at this and they decide that it is a credible strategy that they want to endorse and support and get behind. So they could take over the bill. That's one option that's certainly available to them. 
uh, and that would mean that it would likely be able to progress faster through the Scottish Parliament and so I think that the timetable we set out uh, with having the referendum in September next year is, is possible. And looking forward a bit further, two and a half years to the uh, uh, 2026 uh, Scottish elections, do you think that could be the Alapa breakthrough, the independence breakthrough? I hope it will be, yes. I think there is a, a groundswell out there of people who are not willing to just talk about or think about Scottish independence as an abstract concept. You know, they support independence because they want to have independence as soon as possible. They want a party that is able to articulate and pursue a strategy that can get us to that, you know, point where we become an independent country. You know, this is urgent for many people who are out there. So I think that ALBA is the party that is, you know, leaving no stone unturned in this search for how do we present a strategy that's going to work, that's going to get us there. And so I really hope that people look at this and they think this is something they want to support and they can come out and vote ALBA and we should hopefully be looking at picking up a number of seats at the next Scottish election. And Neil Hanvey, you won your own parliamentary seat against the odds. Yes. Can Alapa make a, a breakthrough and win independence against the odds? I, I don't see any reason why not. Um, you know, one of the things that I think is, is apparent uh, uh, since 2007 when you uh, secured the first minority uh, government for the SNP. From that time and uh, moving forward, Scottish politics has been uh, in a paradigm shift, a complete change from the old Labour Guard to something new. And in any change like that, there's always turbulence. But we saw in 2015 that that change can come swiftly and be very dramatic. So, you know, the Scottish people are clearly no fools. And uh, uh, that 54% of the Scottish population who want to see Scotland independent, I think, will back the politicians who are, they believe, are absolutely focused on independence and discard those who have used the cause of independence for other purposes. Neil Hanvey, Ash Reagan, two Arapa Group leaders in two parliaments, thank you for joining me on Scotland Speaks with Pleasure. Alex Sutton. Last week, we featured a show on our National St Andrews Day and the campaigners who wish to see it and our Saltar flag assume a much greater role in modern Scotland. We spoke to Fraser Thompson of the Flag Trust, MSP Michelle Thompson, and the man who made St Andrews Day a bank holiday, former MP and MSP Dennis Canavan. This is what they had to say. And uh, the historian Nigel Tranter said uh, it can be given to few, if any, nation to be able to pinpoint a specific location where its national saint was adopted, where the country came into being, and where its national flag was created. And that's Athelsonford. We want to make sure that we have the, the best possible attraction there for Scots and people all over the world to come and visit. Was I understand that the Winter Festival, which was underway for a while, is not being funded at the moment. And of course, St Andrew's Day, I think, ran all the way through that kind of difficult time, uh, because as we know, trade is much hard to do before you hit the kind of Christmas rush. Um, so I, I understand that's not happening uh, at the moment and going through to, I think it went through actually into Burns Day, if I recall correctly, but you'll know better than me. So again, I suppose it comes down to, of all the priority calls that the Scottish Government's got, um, that's not a priority at the moment, the funds required for the Winter Festival. So I suppose I've taken a view, again, you, I want to contribute. I, want, I signed up to the furtherance of all Scottish interests and, of course, independence for Scotland. This fits squarely under the furtherance of all Scottish interests. And I would say... There's an appetite for it as well. We've got some of the universities involved in it because they see that an understanding of what St Andrews is about and how that links to the values of Scotland, they see that they can promote their brand on the world stage and also attract more foreign students. So there is both an appetite and an interest out there. The, the, the cross-party group was set up a few years ago uh, I'm the secretary and Michelle Thompson, MSP, is the convener of our cross-party group. And we are working hard to try and raise the profile of St Andrew's Day celebrations, including the broader recognition uh, of the holiday. You know, Scotland is, when it comes to holidays, Scotland is near the bottom of the league. And Scotland is one of the few countries in the world 
where we do not have a national day of celebration, just one day in the year when the whole nation can get together and celebrate our national identity, our cultural diversity, and also our membership of the, the international uh, community. I mean, when you look around the world, I mean, the, the French have got Bastille Day, um, the Australians have got Australia Day, uh, the Irish have got St. Patrick's Day, which is a, a bank holiday, both North uh, and, and South. Uh, and uh, in the United States, um, they've got more than one uh, national day. They've got uh, Thanksgiving Day, which falls around about St. Andrew's Day. Uh, and they've also got Independence Day and and other national holidays like Martin Luther King Day. Uh, so I really do think, um, you know, if we work harder to try and raise the profile of St. Andrew's Day, including a broader recognition of the, the holiday, and I really do think there's a role here uh, for the the, the uh, Scottish local authorities and also organisations such as uh, the Scottish Trade Union Congress because uh, uh, workers deserve an additional day off, in my view, uh, and it would be a great day of celebration for the whole nation. And this is what you had to say in reply. Charlie Abel says, How many bank holidays do we have? Less in Scotland than in England. But our banks will be shut on the English bank holidays in any case. A national holiday for our Saint Day should be a given and would be a much needed boost for Scottish identity and our economy. Maybe we should all just take the day off until it becomes a reality. Long term it would be a positive action, a day for us. Jacqueline says, great show as always, thanks Alex and Taz. Especially enjoyed Dennis and what he had to say. Caveat for Dennis, eye on your flag. Stephen O'Brien says, Scotland will always do better making our own decisions for ourselves. It's that simple, but sadly too many Scots are scared by the lies of our English colonialists. Our problem has never been the English. It has been Scots who live without imagination of what Scotland could be. Douglas Kearney says, High time we had you back, Alex Salmon. And finally, Maureen says, Excellent show. Want your chair to Zemina. Well, Maureen, it's a fight for me to get it off our kittens. Never mind passing it on to you. Thank you. Now we've reached that part in the show where normally and ordinarily I would pass over to Alex for his favourite part of Scotland Speaks with Alex Am, which of course is Hidden Heroes, sponsored by Flagship Media. But I have received loads of requests from people who want us to refresh over some of the Hidden Heroes we've done so far. Now, given we've covered between about 18 and 20, if I recall correctly, I've decided that over the next two weeks' episodes we'll do a great compilation of them so you can see them all in one place, one after the other. Now, meanwhile, back here in Aberdeen, 
Alex is joined by Kenny McCaskill MP to assess the importance of this week's strategic Alba move moving forward and of course his work at Westminster. Over to Alex and Kenny. <laughs> Well, thanks very much. I was delighted to hear from the Glasgow colleague about the importance of international affairs because we support independence because that's Scotland's natural position. We should be an independent nation. But we also have to explain to people just what it benefits. And that's why Ash's bill is important. But we have to explain what it allows us to do. It allows us domestically to stop the absurdity, as I'll come on, of an energy-rich Scotland seeing a third of its people in fuel poverty. But it also stops the absurdity and indeed the perversity of actions being taken in our name that we do not agree with or sympathise with in any shape or form. Because on Wednesday I attended the International Day of Solidarity with Palestine. I listened to the Palestinian ambassador. We see the carnage that is unfolding on our screens. Believe me, what we see on BBC, STV and Sky is sanitised. If you look at Al Jazeera, you'll see a bit more of the reality. But the footage that was shown on that day is truly horrific. 20 years ago, we were taken into a war that has made the world a less safe, a far worse place by a Labour government. Now we have actions being taken by a Tory government that equally are making our world a less safe place and equally are actions that I do not wish associated with, nor do I wish my country associated with. This is not in our name. I put down a parliamentary question, encouraged by colleagues in Declassified UK who I worked closely with, to ask about the operations coming out of RAF Arcateri. I got a note back from table office in Westminster saying there was a block on by the Ministry of Defence. You don't see anything in the papers because there's a D notice and none of the papers will write about it. Fortunately, I want to tell this story because it shows there's still civil servants with integrity. But I woke up early last week and saw an email in from table office and there was a member of staff that said I was looking at the question you tabled and I just wanted to say that actually blocks have to be renewed after every recess and the MOD haven't done so. Would you like me to table your question? <laughs> to which I said yes please. By the time I got yes please within 50 seconds I got an email back saying it's tabled. Now I got the answer to that just yesterday because I asked whether the US military is using RAF Arkatiri to send A weapons and B other military equipment to Israel. And the answer is the Ministry of Defence does not offer comments on Allies operations. The answer ladies and gentlemen is they are. Chinook helicopters are flying from RAF Arkatiri into Israel to supply Israel. That is not in our name what we see unfolding. And of course, why did they do it from RAF Arcaturi? Not just because it's very close to Israel, but it's because when peace activists in the United States try to FOI the US military and their FOI legislation is very good, they'll get the answer, but we can't give you information. That's for the United Kingdom. And so you get pushed from pillar to post. This is not in our name. A young Arab civil rights activist I know wrote to me, disgusted, he said, he noticed that since the 7th of October, there had only been 25 questions to the Ministry of Defence about Britain and Israel, and indeed Israeli actions. And he pointed out, 15 of them came from me. <laughs> Six of them came from the Labour Party. There is a conspiracy of silence about what is happening in Gaza. We are being fed a sanitised version on TV and the United Kingdom is complicit in the actions of Israel and America. It is not in my name, and I look forward to the day when we have not a king, but who a president, as in President Higgins, who can say that we support a ceasefire and we also support justice for the Palestinian people. I'm now joined by Alipa's deputy leader, my deputy, Kenny McCaskill, Member of Parliament. Kenny, in a, a fairly typical and vigorous address, uh, you were talking about the situation in the Middle East, uh, the situation of the energy riches of Scotland, the fuel poverty of Scots. How do these uh, 
huge international or economic and social issues relate to the independence campaign? Well, I think I and other members of ALBA support independence. But we've also got to explain to people why independence is appropriate and why it matters. It's not just an absolute concept. It's something that changes our daily lives. It's something that allows us to impact on world affairs. And that's why, firstly, I commented on Gaza, because it's 20 years ago that a war was unleashed by new labour that has made the world a far less safe place. Thousands, hundreds of thousands died. Now we're seeing a tragedy being perpetrated in the Middle East. Iraq wasn't in our name, Gaza isn't in our name, and that's why we need independence, because a recent parliamentary question I asked about the American forces using RAF Arkatiri in Cyprus to supply military equipment to the Israelis. The British government refused to answer. Indeed, they have a block on questions on this. That is simply unacceptable. It's bad enough that Labour have failed to support a ceasefire, when in fact that is what we need, not just a humanitarian pause given we're now back at war. But if the United Kingdom is complicit in Israeli and American aggression, then that crosses a line. So we need to be independent so that we can be like Ireland, where they've had a president who has spoken out, not just calling for a ceasefire, but has called for justice for the Palestinian people. But how would uh, independent Scotland, I mean, President Higgins, you're right, has spoken out very forcibly uh, and commendably, but how would an independent Scotland have any more influence in bringing about a just peace between uh, Israel and the Palestinians uh, than an independent island is? Well, it's very difficult for small independent nations, but first of all, you can make sure that your hands are clean. What happened in Iraq was disgraceful, and I'm glad that I'm able to say, not in my name, I do not support what Israel is doing and how it's being supported by America, and I certainly don't want to have my hands guilty of the crimes that are happening in Gaza. So can we stop it? No, but we can act along with others in the world, in the United Nations, and speak out. This axis of Israel, USA, and indeed the UK, it's simply unacceptable. And what Scotland has to do is to stand with nations like in Ireland and say, not in our name, and we're not being complicit. The fact of the matter is it does appear that America is arming Israel through RAF bases. And as far as I'm concerned, that must not be our culpability. And your campaign on the energy resources of Scotland uh, and the energy poverty of Scots, is there an indication that it's, uh, it's striking home, that it's striking a chord, that it's getting a response? Well, it certainly does. It certainly seems to have put some uh, uh, fire into the SNP who are speaking up a bit more. They're not actually recognising where they got the information from. Uh, but, you know, last week, myself and other uh, and my colleague Neil Hanvey were pointing out the injustice of the standing charges. It's many years ago since in the SNP we campaigned against a poll tax. Standing charges are an energy poll tax. The billionaire with the swimming pool, i.e. the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, pays exactly the same as the person in a cold council flat here in Aberdeen. That cannot be right. It's a far greater share of their income, of their energy costs, and yet they pay the same standing charges. I would have liked the SNP to be a bit more vigorous. Never mind, I'm not bothering about no getting a thank you for the information, but it's fundamentally wrong. Are you saying that SNP, members of Parliament, don't even acknowledge where they get the statistics on energy from. Well, what I query is why they've had millions of pounds in short money and Jim Eady, the Alba Party Westminster Group researcher, simply got the information by writing to Ofgem. Uh, perhaps if they used the resource a wee bit better, Scotland would be in a better place. You know, we used to malign the feeble 50. We've now got the feeble 40 or whatever it is, but it seems to change on a daily basis. But there's another sleight of hand going on in the United Kingdom because they've said that energy prices are going to be lower this winter although that's uh, hard for people to take when they can't heat their homes in this cold spell we've got at the moment. But they've changed the ground rules. We're actually going to be, the average bill is going to be £800 more this year than last year. But when they talk about the energy price guarantee coming down, there's a sleight of hand. Because Ofgem prepares something called the notional energy usage, uh, and that is calculated on an average household. What they've done is reduce the actual usage provided. 
Now, some of that can be justified because new houses are better insulated, but see if you're sitting in a 1960s, 50s, 70s council flat, it's not got any warmer, you've not had any insulation, so you're still using the same. But what they've actually done is they've reduced the notional usage, not just because apparently insulation is better, but because people are using less. The only reason that people are using less is they are self-disconnecting. They cannot afford to pay, so they're turning down their heating. And as a consequence of that, the Tories are saying people are using less electricity, the energy price guarantee can drop because people don't require the same energy. They required the same energy before, the price has gone up and they can't afford to pay it, and Scotland is energy rich. And this is the energy capital of Europe, and yet our people can't heat their homes. Now you've made your, your name in politics by very strong campaigns when you started out on the poll tax, now this energy campaign. But underlying all that has been your support for Scottish independence. How do you place Ash Reagan's latest initiative, this new Parliament Powers over Independence Bill? Where do, where do you rank that as, as being one of the key that will unlock the door? Well, I think it's transformative. The problem at the present moment is hope is dying. That is the situation. People are looking at the SNP, they put their trust and faith in them, they're not delivering. They're looking at the alternative in the Labour Party and they're saying, you're having a laugh there. They're not going to deliver anything. What is to be done? And what we've got to show is firstly that independence is relevant, it changes our lives, it transforms, it. we can heat our homes, we can avoid responsibility for tragedies in Palestine and speak out about what's wrong. But equally, we can actually achieve it. It's not something that you just wish it would happen along with winning the lottery, it's something you can actually deliver. And what Ash's bill shows is that there are steps that can be taken and it's about time the SNP started taking them. Kenny McCaskill, thank you for joining me again on Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond. Thank you. When I was sitting with uh, Ash Reagan a, a week or so ago in the, the Holyrood Hotel beside the, the, the Scottish Parliament, uh, helping her to, to launch her new bill on the Scottish Powers uh, Bill to extend the powers of the Parliament to include a uh, legislating for negotiating Scottish independence, uh, I was moved to say to the pretty well-established assembled press corps that I thought this was the, the initiative to break the, the logjam in the Scottish constitutional question. And I absolutely believe that, because it provides the, the missing link, the missing ingredient. It's quite clear after uh, well, eight years of desultory approaches to Westminster, to please, to beseech them, to allow us to have our own referendum, that with increasing confidence, United Kingdom Prime Ministers of the Tory variety have said no, or not, is the, this is not the time, or not now, or just plain no. And that Keir Starmer would carry forward that uh, same tactic of just straight obstructionism, never mind the democracy, never mind self-determination, never mind any of that, just say no. And if you're going to do something about it, you have to find a different strategy, you have to find a new approach, you have to find a strategy which is born in Scotland, not in Westminster. And that's where Ash Reagan's bill comes in. If you combine her bill, 
to extend the powers of the Parliament to encompass the independence negotiations, something that the Scottish Parliament can do, could do now, could do it in time to have that vote for the 10th anniversary of the 2014 referendum. If you combine that with the ARAPA policy to seek a direct mandate to each and every election, then you've got the democratic double whammy on Westminster. You've got the assent of the people in a referendum and you've got the votes of the people in an election. That's what's so powerful. It does have the ability to break the logjam. It does have the ability to galvanise the movement. A movement which realises that Westminster is not going to assist us, whether it's the Westminster Parliament or the UK Supreme Court, if we uh, plead with them to get independence. We have to find initiatives which are born in Scotland. And this initiative takes Scotland's future back into Scotland's hands. And now over to Tasmina, who's going to tell us about something very special that's coming up in next week's show. Thank you very much, Alex, and it's goodbye from us here in Aberdeen, where it's a tad cold. However, we'll warm your hearts over the next couple of weeks as we bring together Scotland's best hidden heroes in association with flagship media. So remember to tune in on Twitter, X I should say, Facebook, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, you name it, we're on it. We'll see you next Thursday at nine o'clock. Till then, stay safe and goodbye. This is an exciting time in Scotland's story and understanding our past will help us determine our future. And when Scotland's voice is heard, it charts the way forward. This is Scotland Speaks with Alex Salmond.